Jesus ever, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, all may change, but Jesus never, glory to his name, he who formed an erring creator never disappeared, he who came to faithless heaven, all I never change not. And Lord, uh, uh, you have mercy on us and grace upon us. And Lord, thank you for answering our prayers and helping us every day. Lord, thank you that we can be here tonight and sing your praises and uh, hear your word preached. And God, uh, uh, bow in prayer and, and put our petitions before your throne. And I pray God will trust in you and God see answers to prayer. Help us, Lord, in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Now, um, preachers have a hard time during election season because like anybody else, we have political opinions, but we're not allowed to share them from this pulpit. Um... They, they came out uh, a few months after uh, Trump got elected and uh, said that some of that had gone uh, away. But uh, frankly, I haven't seen any paperwork or anything really that tells me so. And it, it, everybody keeps sending me these things about what preachers should and shouldn't do during the election. And, and they all say that uh, uh, pretty well political opinions from the pulpit are still forbidden. But, and however... Uh, we can speak on moral issues if we want to. Uh, we can speak directly from the Bible about an act or something somebody did. Uh, that's not a considered endorsing anybody. Um, we've got articles from uh, different news organizations uh, that I printed out on the back. Um, that's not considered uh, endorsing either. But tonight, um, during the election season... Uh, I thought I would say some things to uh, Christians um, and the population in general that's listening on YouTube 
Um, 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Um, in 1 Samuel along here, uh, the nation of Israel does something that they had never done before. They came to one of the prophets uh, and they said, look, we don't want your sons reigning over us and being prophets over us. We like you, but your sons stink and uh, we want a king. And so um, Samuel got his feelings hurt. Let's face it, he did. He was very offended. And God uh, said, now look, they... Uh, what, what is your problem, basically, Samuel? Uh, they rejected me, not you. And uh, so uh, you go back and tell them they can have a king. And so that's what Samuel does. But in uh, chapter number 12, 1 Samuel 12, verse 14, um, he says some things to them, which I think are apropos to any nation that is coming into a time where uh, the administration might change. But let's face it, there's going to be all kinds of changes. We're going to have different congressmen, different senators, different, uh, I don't know, is the dog catcher running for election? You know, we might have a new one of those, uh, county council people, state people. Um, and any nation that's going through a change that way needs to remember some things and needs to do some things if they want God's blessing on the country. Our, what is the, one of our songs? says, God bless America. Um, and then another one talks about God shed his grace on thee. Well, uh, God hasn't done that for a long time. Uh, matter of fact, for the last three presidents, we've had so many natural disasters and man-made disasters. Uh, I've lost count of them. From the buildings being run into by airplanes, by terrorists, to uh, Katrina, to Ivan, to floods, to f I don't know how many fires California's had in the last 20 years. I I've lost count. We've had them here, floods and tornadoes. And uh, last 20 years, we've had years where we've had more tornadoes in, in like one place and than any time in history. One little town in Missouri had like 17 tornadoes in one day. Well, I used to... I used to have this fellow that I worked with way back a long time ago in D.C. when I worked in D.C. And he was kind of a wag. Uh, he didn't like God. He didn't like me being a Christian kid uh, employed in his company and uh, that he worked for. And uh, he would say little smart things. And one of his favorite things he would say, he would say, death is God's way of saying he doesn't like you. Well... That's funny. It really is kind of funny because it has a glimmer of truth in it. Uh, there are some people God gets rid of because he just doesn't like them. Because they disobeyed him and turned him down so often and turned into his enemy. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't have grace, but if you reject God's grace and mercy so long, um, you know, God does give up on people, I think. But I will say this, I'm wondering where all those tornadoes and floods and fires and things, see, I believe God controls all that stuff. Maybe a way of God saying he may not like us. Well, I want God to like our country. I want God to like our, 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 our civilization, our society. And verse 14 tells us how we can get back there if you want to get back there, Christian. Let's read 1 Samuel 12, 14, and I call this sermon four things to make the kingdom right and blessed. It starts with an if. That puts the onus on you and me. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord... Then shall both ye and your and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Heavenly Father, help us now. 
Lord, help us to be good citizens, but Lord, help us to be good Christian citizens. And Lord, help us to take this thing to heart and pray about it and somehow spread the news to other people that we know that are Christians. Because it's going to take as many of us as we can get doing the right thing before you can bless us again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, about the only thing the world can advise you to do during the coming elections is one thing. Go and vote. That's all the thing they can advise you to do. And I say, go and vote. If you're not registered, go register. You don't have to register Democrat, Republican. Me, I'm, Demo I'm uh, not Democrat or Republican. I'm, I'm unaffiliated. You say, well, you don't get to vote in the primaries. Well, ain't much to vote for most of the time anyway, to tell you the truth. But God has better advice. This new ruler, Saul, he had his problems. And you know what? He didn't follow verse 14 and 15. And God had to pick another ruler. And we're not the nation of Israel, folks. God's under no obligation to pick another ruler. If we get a good one or two, we better thank God and do the very best we can to get God on our side. Now, I want to look at four things tonight. First of all, it says fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Now, what do you mean by fear the Lord? Well, you know, uh, I feared my dad, but I love my dad. And, you know, most of the time when I was doing what dad told me to do, uh, things was okay. I could love my dad and, uh, you know, give him a hug and had no problem with dad. The problem came with dad is when I disobeyed dad. Then I was a little afraid of dad. Because dad was a whole lot bigger and stronger than me. And you know, that's the problem with Christians even. They're not afraid of God anymore. They're not doing exactly what God wants them to do. A lot of them. And they're no more afraid of God than a man in the moon. Uh, I want to tell you something. First of all, fear and trust go together when it comes to God. Psalm 115 verse 11. A very interesting verse. It says, Ye that fear the Lord, comma, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Well, if you trust the Lord, uh, you fear the Lord. Because I used to know one thing about my dad, that he could take care of me when the chips were down. Because he was just about stronger than anybody I knew. He was a pipe fitter. He had them Popeye arms. I never saw my dad get angry enough to hurt somebody, but I have seen my dad step between me and somebody that he thought was going to hurt me, and the look in his eye made that person go away, because he didn't want to tangle with dad. Now, dad knew about his strengths and his weaknesses. Daddy never had a gun in the house. He never carried a gun in the car, and I asked him when I was older, I said, dad, remember when I was a kid, you had a, you had a starter pistol in the glove compartment one time that shot blanks. I, and I said, why did you have it instead of a real gun? He said, because I came from a family and we had bad tempers. And I was afraid I was going to shoot somebody. So I had a fake gun. And he only used it one time. Some guy came up to, he stopped at a stop sign. And some guy came up and was beating on his window with a stick. And daddy just pulled the uh, glove compartment open and the gun popped out on the little lid. And the guy looked down and he went away. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only time dad ever had to pull a gun on anybody and he really he just showed it to him and popped it back out but uh, I, I trusted my dad um, when it came to protecting me but I feared my dad because I didn't want to get on my dad's bad side uh, you know God knows what he's doing uh, now may, maybe maybe uh, not all times uh, will uh, your dad know what he's doing uh, dads are only human um, a number of our families um, uh, support uh, orphan children overseas. And there was one family that had a, a little girl that they were supporting in the nation of Greece. And uh, finally, after uh, several years of supporting this little orphan girl, they decided to bring her to the United States and, and so that she could live with them. And I guess they even intended to adopt this little girl. And uh, one day... Uh, uh, soon after she came, uh, they, they took her to church uh, with them. And uh, when she got there at church, they asked for testimonies, and she raised her hand. And 
apparently she spoke pretty good English. And uh, so uh, among the things that she said, she said, God permitted me to become an orphan. Uh, evil men killed my father and my mother died of cancer. But God knew what he was doing. As a result of being left an orphan, I entered a Christian orphanage and I found Christ there. And if it hadn't been for finding Christ and being in that orphan, I never would have met this family here. And, and now I'm here in the United States and I know Jesus Christ is my Savior and I'm going to heaven. And she says, I am so blessed. Well, God knows what he's doing. So fear him because he doesn't know what he's doing. And trust him. And you know what? It's an amazing thing. Psalm 27, 1 says an amazing thing. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That verse says there that if you fear the Lord and you trust the Lord, that will actually make you a stronger person. You know why people in this country are so weak? When it come, we, what do we call the new journey? Snowflakes? You know why that is? Because they don't fear the Lord. They don't trust the Lord. And they're not strong. They're not strong. Fear the Lord. And then secondly, we need to serve the Lord. Christians, why do we expect God to bless our country if we're not willing to serve God? Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 says something about serving the Lord. It says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? Well, that's a good question, Moses. But to fear the Lord thy God, well, there's the fear again, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God. It doesn't stop there. To serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. You know what serving the Lord takes? It takes dedication. It takes dedication. Now, for years, Christian churches had rededications. Well, some preachers have posited that, uh, you know, maybe they weren't dedicated in the first place. And that's possible. But, you know, I don't care if you're dedicating or rededicating or uh, for the hundredth time. Dedicate yourself to serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. Because He loves you and you ought to love Him back by serving Him. It has to do with your love for Him. Joshua 24, 14. Now we know the famous verse in Joshua 24. But for me and my house we will serve the Lord. But look what it says in verse number 14. It says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Uh, you know what? Uh, you read that whole chapter, you'll find something that Joshua, and I'll, I'll boil all the uh, 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 essence down for you. Uh, you can't fudge serving the Lord. You can't fudge it. You can't, you can't fake it. You can't fudge it. You're either serving the Lord or you're not. Reminds me of a little story about Johnny. Little Johnny had trouble pronouncing the letter R. So his teacher gave him a sentence to practice at home. Robert gave Richard a wrap in the ribs for roasting the rabbit so rare. Robert gave Richard a wrap in the ribs for roasting the rabbit so rare. And that's what he was supposed to say like ten times a day. For some days, uh, uh, the teacher waited for Johnny to, you know, have time to do this sentence. So finally, after some time, uh, uh, she uh, sat him down and, and asked uh, him to, to rattle the sentence off for her. So uh, uh, Johnny rattled it off like this. Bob gave Dick a poke in the side for not cooking the bunny enough. <laughs> she got looking at him like, okay. <laughs> Creative writing, you know. He he avoided that letter R completely. I don't think the letter R is in this sense at all. Well, you know, that's the way a lot of Christians do. They just, 
you know, they just kind of avoid <laughs> that service thing there. Uh, uh, R means ready, ready to serve, ready to sing, ready to visit, ready to teach, ready to be truly committed. Amen. How, how are you handling that R, Christian? Amen. Are you serving or are you not? You can't fudge it. Psalm 100 verse 2 says something surprising about now. Now, now I said the fear of the Lord will make you strong. Uh, there's something surprising about serving the Lord. Psalm 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. If you're serving God, it's going to make you glad. It is going to make you glad. Now, sometimes you do get tired. Uh, but you know what? Even when I'm tired, I sure like hearing people sing about the Lord. I like to turn them, that choir music on. I got, I got an album of all the Fanny Crosby songs. And one of Ira Sankey and one of Isaac Watts. And, and I got one called Just As I Am. And, and they're put up by some of these choirs in the United States and Europe. And, and, and boy, I, I love listening to that stuff. Liz, the people just belt out praises to God. And these people, I think they mean it pretty good. I've heard some choirs. I've had a few of them. Of them do like, well, they're just doing this because it's something to do. But these people on these records, they, they, sing, they sing pretty lively like they really mean it. Then thirdly, oh, Samuel said, obey his voice. Obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. Now, you know what some... Something interesting that I found out in the Bible. There's not a lot of verses in the Bible that say obey the Lord. Most of them say obey his voice or uh, obey his commandments. Or you know, We even have ones in the Pauline that say obey the gospel, obey the truth. There's only one verse in the New Testament that tells us to obey God. That's Acts chapter 5 verse 29. That's, that's the famous thing that Peter told the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. That's the only verse in the Bible that actually comes right out and says, Obey God rather than man. Now, Psalm 18, 43 and 44 says, Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou hast made me the head of the heathen, a people... <coughs> Excuse me. I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. Now, David is talking here, but it's the Lord speaking through David. He's talking about, this is the prophecy of the church age. The Jews, he came into his own, and his own received him not. And then he opened the door to as many as received him. And those that have received Christ, we're the, we're the strangers that have served God, that have feared God, that have obeyed God. <clears throat> we're supposed to obey God, folks. And this country has been a miserable failure at it for more than almost a hundred years. We, we, we dumped the book about the turn of 1900s, we got rid of the King James Bible, and then we got rid of the uh, uh, prohibition in 1933, and now we're fixing to ditch all the prohibitions when it comes to marijuana. Uh, this country's going to be such a mess in 10 years, you won't even know it's the same country if we don't start obeying the Lord. And, and it's the Christians that need to obey the Lord. The world never has obeyed God. Obey the Lord. Then finally, we're not to rebel against the Lord's will. We're not to rebel against the Lord's will. First uh, Samuel uh, 12. Samuel was awful worried. They had wanted a king. They had wanted to be like the other nations. And he was worried that if they got a king, they would end up acting like the world and, and worshiping like the world. And you know, if you look far enough in the history in uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. They, they ended up just like the nations around them. And God had to can them and send them to Babylon. And that wasn't the first time they went into captivity. You just read the book of Judges. 
So my friend, we are not to rebel against the Lord. He has a will for our life. Find out what it is. You know, Saul disobeyed God in 1 Samuel 15. He was supposed to kill all the Amalekites. And he kept all the, the good sheep and the good cows and, uh, you know, all the goodies. And he brought Agag uh, in front of uh, Samuel. And, of course, Samuel said, is this the bleeding of sheep I hear? But in verse... Uh, 1523 uh, Samuel says this to Saul he says for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because as thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he also hath rejected thee from being king rebellion comes from several areas one rejection of God's words this country definitely has replacement with bad spiritual things like witchcraft for instance uh, have you looked at Saturday morning cartoons for the last 30 years that's all it is even when I was a kid they were starting to put it on there and real stubborn refusal to get right with God and, and I'm afraid a lot of Christians are that way they won't come to church they won't read their Bible they won't pray they won't give up their bad habits they won't they won't change they, they they're they've decided that they're just going to ignore the warnings of us preachers to get up and preach till we're blue in the face well, you know what Proverbs 17 11 says it says that an evil man seeketh only rebellion Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against them. You rebel against God. You know what God's going to give you? Rotten governments. Rotten governments. There was an overladen coal barge that stood in the river. A sailor reported to the captain that water was gaining upon the vessel. But the captain drove him away with scoffing. Saying, no, we're not sinking. Go away. Twice and thrice the warning was repeated by different men that water was coming into the bottom of the boat. Each time it went unheeded by the captain. At last the barge began to give evidence of sinking. It was listing badly to one side. The captain ordered the men into the boats. As they took their places, he said, See, I've told you we have plenty of time. And he took out his knife to cut the cable to the barge once he was in the boat. He fell back with a cry of horror when he realized that all the boats were chained to the barge with iron chains. In conclusion, God has a hand in the affairs of men. You say, how can I make a difference? Well... Christian, you as a personal obedient son or daughter of Christ, you make sure you fear the Lord. You make sure that you serve the Lord. You make sure you obey the Lord and rebel not against His commandments. And then you get down and you pray and go tell everybody you can that they need to do the same thing. And we may have a chance. That's a lot to ask between now and November. But God does have grace. God does have mercy. And, and you know something? The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want to see a country go down the tubes. He really doesn't. But He can only do so much. We still have a free will in this country. Let's pray that folks exercise it in the right direction and get God's blessing upon the country once again. Heavenly Father, help us. The Lord, uh, we need a revival in this country. Many of us have been asking you for a long time to give it to us. God, uh, but it, it depends so much on us. God, you're willing and you're waiting and you're wanting. So I pray that you'll just open Christians' eyes and help them to see what they need to do. 
And God, help them to seek your face. And God, God, get to a place where they want to please you. And God, maybe there'll be a glimmer of hope for us in the future. Help us now. In this hour, God, come back and get us. Because I'm afraid it's either going to be rapture or rupture, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.